Okay, great. Chapter 19, verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason... A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So, they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, It is better not to marry. Jesus replied, Not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For some are eunuchs because they were born that way. Others were made that way by men, and others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. Well, thank you very much indeed, Laura, for that reading. Let me add my welcome to Joe's. It's great to see you. It'd be great if you could have that passage open in front of you, and uh, you'll find a, a, an outline on the inside of the sheet. Well, when I was uh, growing up, <clears throat> every day, every single day, uh, my mother used to make my brother and I swallow a teaspoon of cod liver oil. If you're lucky enough to have grown up in a different age or with less health-conscious parents, then congratulations to you because you have escaped the most disgusting taste experience on the planet. I'm talking about cod liver oil. Not in a little flavorless capsule or a nice flavored drink, but one pure fishy distillation thrust with great protest down our little throats. And you know what my mother would say? I know this is difficult to swallow, but it's going to do you a lot of good. And this morning, we may need a similar word of encouragement as we listen to this part of Matthew's Gospel. I am very excited about this new series in Matthew, which, as Joe told us, we've entitled Real Jesus, Real Hope. Each week, we're going to get up close to Jesus in some of his most thrilling and controversial moments. We will see his goodness and glory lift off the pages of the Bible. And each time, we're also going to find ourselves again and again at that point of decision that is unavoidable when you meet the real Jesus. Do I really believe in him? Is he really my only hope in life and death? Am I going to take seriously his call to live single-mindedly for his kingdom? It's going to be challenging. It's going to be great. Real Jesus, real hope. But we begin this morning, as you'll have already gathered from that reading, by diving into the deep end and diving into one of the most difficult passages in the whole gospel. And I think it's difficult for two reasons. Firstly, uh, 
Jesus' teaching here is unusually complex and controversial. There are a number of difficulties simply comprehending what is being said. There are several translation issues and difficulties of grammar. There are some difficulties grasping the flow of the argument. What does Jesus mean exactly by marital unfaithfulness in verse 9? Why does Mark omit that exception from his version in Mark chapter 10? Why are the disciples so shocked at Jesus' teaching in verse 10? And why does Jesus respond to their surprising question in an even more surprising way in verses 11 and 12? No wonder this passage in verses 4 to 9 in particular has been scrutinized and debated and poured over by scholars and commentators and Bible readers for centuries. And there are far more issues here than we've got time for in one sermon. But it's also difficult for a second reason. And that is because the subject matter of marriage breakdown and divorce and adultery and remarriage, all that can of worms that is opened up in this particular passage, is so personal and often so painful. As we'll see in a moment, God has made humanity as male and female for the purpose of sexual union in marriage. And so the things that Jesus is talking about are deeply connected to who we are in our inner being, deeply connected to who God wants us to be and how he wants us to flourish as human beings. And because God cares so deeply about marriage, and because marriage is so much a part of God's plan for human flourishing, the breakdown and failure of any marriage is always a matter of pain and regret and often misery, not just for the couple involved, but for the whole network of relationships that the marriage has created, for children, for parents, for in-laws, for grandparents, for friends, and the effects of marriage breakdown ripples out into society. And I doubt there is anybody in this gathering this morning who in some way, either directly or indirectly, has not experienced the damage, the emotional turmoil, the pain, the sadness, the disappointment, and often the guilt of marriage breakdown. When I was in my early teens, my parents divorced very suddenly, and I still feel the pain of it now. It still affects me, it still affects my family 40 years later. But it's precisely because of those difficulties that Jesus' teaching here is so important for us and why we must pay careful attention to it and not shy away from it. It will, I think, exercise our little gray cells a bit more than usual this morning. There are a couple of moments we'll have to really uh, think hard and listen carefully to what Jesus is saying, although that's what we normally do. And for some of it, it will be painful. As my mum used to say about Cod Royal, though, although it is difficult to swallow, it will do us good. That is a promise. The word of God is always good for us. In fact, I want to suggest that sometimes it is when the word of God is most uncomfortable to hear, when it is most countercultural most difficult to swallow, then it is doing us most good because it's correcting our thinking. It's aligning our lives with God's way. And above all, it's showing us where real hope is to be found. So let's ask for God's help as we turn to his word. And as we do, we're going to pray that his word will in fact not be codly royal to us, But as we saw in Proverbs 24 last week, it will be gorgeous, sweet honey, good for us, making us wise. So let's ask for God's help as we turn to his word. Back in chapter 18, Jesus said, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in your kindness, You have given us your words to enable us to live in this sinful world as your disciples with real hope. And we pray that now you'd grant us by your spirit soft hearts to receive these words of Jesus with the humility of children. 
help each of us not to worry what other people are hearing, but to listen for ourselves, to hear you speak directly to us this morning so that we might believe it and obey it for our good and for your glory. Amen. Well, you'll see on the sheet three headings, the trap, the truth, and the children. Firstly, the trap in verses 1 to 3. Look with me again at verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> when, Jesus had <clears throat> excuse me. when Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Before we rush into the conversation that follows, we must pause on these verses and note the way they set the context for what follows. If you've been part of this church for the last few years as we've been working through Matthew, uh, you will remember that Matthew is structured around five main blocks of Jesus' teaching, each interspersed with blocks of action. And so verse 1 is an important marker of that structure. It reminds us that we are moving from the fourth teaching section, which is chapter 18, into the next action section, which runs all the way to the end of chapter 23. Now, it's not that Jesus doesn't do any teaching in these chapters, but they're not teaching sections. That is, he is not taking his disciples to one side and deliberately instructing them as he does in the teaching sections. When Jesus teaches, he is actually responding to questions, often hostile questions. He is often caught up in controversy. And when he is engaging in these kinds of questions, his agenda is never the agenda of the questioners. He actually has his own agenda, a bigger agenda that he uses to expose the questioner and shine the light on what he really wants to talk about. Now, what is the significance of this for this section? The significance of it is that we are not about to hear the Bible's comprehensive teaching on marriage and divorce. There is more to say on that matter, and as we'll see, Jesus has other things to teach us in this section. The second thing to notice in verses 1 and 2 is where Jesus is. In verse 2, we are told that he is continuing to do what he has been doing since chapter 4, namely doing miracles and healing people, which Matthew has made clear is to give us a glimpse of what he calls the kingdom of heaven that is the message that he is proclaiming. So all the way through from chapter 4 onwards, Jesus has been healing and teaching in combination. And the healing actually gives us a glimpse of the teaching. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven and the healings and the miracles demonstrate something of what that kingdom will be like. But notice the difference now is the geography. Since chapter 4, most of his ministry has been up north in Galilee. Up north is the place to be, isn't it? And it's the same in Matthew's gospel. But at this point, he takes the step to leave the north and he returns down south very deliberately over the Jordan, back to Judea, the land of his birth. And eventually that journey will take him to Jerusalem. And what's the significance of that? Well, in 1621, he told the disciples that he was going to Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem, he would be killed by the teachers of the law. And so, pull all that together. Here is the context. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to bring about the kingdom of heaven by his death on the cross. And that is the context for the conversation that now follows. Have a look at verse 3. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Before we listen to Jesus' response, we just need to get behind the question a little bit and see that it is, in fact, a trap. We already know that these Pharisees, these teachers of the law, are not motivated by desire to know the truth. They are not coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, you're an expert. We really want your help with this tricky matter. Please, can you help us? 
we know that their agenda is actually nothing less than murder. And in verse 3, Matthew gives us this little word, test or tempt, to remind us that right back in chapter 4, the devil actually came to Jesus to do the same thing. And so these Pharisees, these teachers of the law, are continuing Satan's agenda of testing, tempting Jesus, of making him fail. Now, in what sense is it a trap? <clears throat> in what sense is it a trick question? Well, a couple of reasons. Firstly, because then, as now, the subject of divorce and remarriage was a deeply controversial issue. At this particular time, a famous debate was raging among the Jewish leaders about the interpretation of the law. You may have heard this. It comes from a, a Jewish uh, historian called Josephus who talked uh, quite uh, in detail about these things. That there was a school of rabbis who had a conservative view that said that the only reason you could ever get divorced is if someone had committed adultery in the relationship. But then the other side of the debate was a much more liberal school which said, actually, you could divorce your wife for any and every reason. And so some of the reasons listed are she burnt the dinner, she speaks too loudly and upsets the neighbors, or you just find a woman who is more attractive. These were some of the reasons that that liberal school would give for divorcing your wife. And central to the debate that was raging was the interpretation of Moses' words in Deuteronomy 24, which we'll turn to in a little while. But it was controversial for another reason. You may remember that John the Baptist had been put in prison by Herod because he had denounced Herod's marriage to his divorced brother's wife as unlawful. And where was Herod's jurisdiction? It was in Judea in which region Jesus had now come. And so it's a hot issue. And the question is designed to force Jesus to take sides on this issue. It's a trap. However, he answers the question, he's going to make an enemy of someone. Maybe he's going to be seen even to contradict Moses. And so here are the Pharisees obviously prepared and thought through with their question, designed to trick him up. A devilish question, a satanic trap. But Jesus knows, as always, what is going on. Instead of falling for the trap and answering the question, he does what he did when he was tempted by the devil in chapter 4. He turns to the word of God. And so secondly, he responds with the truth in 4 to 12. The first part of it is the truth about marriage in 4 to 6. Notice how Jesus begins his response. Verse 4, haven't you read, he says. Now, those three words are tremendously important for us to hear this morning. Just like the debates raging among the Pharisees at the time, there are many arguments and debates and opinions in our world, aren't there, about sex and marriage and relationships. And every opinion, every view is really an opinion about what is good for us, at what is right, which is an alternative translation of the word the Pharisees use in verse 3, what is lawful. If you think about it, everybody on this matter thinks they know what is right. Everybody thinks they have a right to determine what is good for them. But look what Jesus says. He says, let's turn to the word of God. Haven't you read, he says. And so he bypasses all the debates and the disputes. He leapfrogs over the Old Testament law and that whole debate and goes right back to the beginning of all things, to the time before sin entered the world, and he shows us what our creator himself intended for marriage. And this is what we need to do, isn't it? Our society is in chaos about these things. Look around the world and you'll see that we are a, a, a nation, a society, a culture that is drowning in darkness because everybody thinks they know what is right. But the more we think that, the more we harm ourselves. And so the, the wise thing is to turn back to the Creator's words. And so have a look at what that means in verse 4 and 5. 
Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Here in two brief verses, Jesus lays out, he summarizes God's fundamental intention for marriage. And he does it from Genesis 1 and 2, from the very beginnings of the Bible. So in verse 4, Jesus quotes Genesis 1.27. And when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, we're meant to understand the whole context is being brought in and thought about there. And so what does Genesis 1 say? It gives us the creation of humanity in two sexes, male and female. It tells us that that creation of male and female is part of what it means to be in the image of God. And it's that creation of male and female that enables humanity to fulfill God's command, to fulfill, to fill the earth, to be fruitful and to subdue it. And now look at verse 5. This time Jesus is quoting from Genesis 2 where we see the creation of the man and woman in more detail. We see the man's joyful recognition of the woman, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, and we see the first marriage of Adam and Eve in the garden. And what Jesus is picking up there is the little comment in Genesis 2, 24. For this reason, a man will leave his mother and father and be united to his wife, and the two will become one. And so Jesus is taking us right back to basics and he's showing the purpose of marriage in the eyes of God. It's not an accident that they are, we are made as male and female. It's not a product of evolution that there are boys and girls and men and women in this world. Jesus is saying this is God's design. Notice in verse 5, for this reason. Why did God do this? Why did he make us male and female? Well, for this reason, for marriage. So that the two will become one in sexual union. Now that simple truth, that fundamental building block, is actually the basis of everything else the Bible says about human sexuality. Sometimes people say things like this. They say Jesus didn't talk about homosexuality or pornography, whatever it is. But of course, this is the Bible's building block for these things. That God created as male and female so that the two can become one in the sexual union of marriage. And so this tells you why, for example, sex is only for marriage. Why sex outside marriage is against God's will. Because it's the sexual union that draws two people together and binds them together in a permanent relationship. It's here that we learn why homosexuality is against God's design, because marriage is designed for a man and a woman. It tells you why, although the Bible is silent on this, it tells you why polygamy falls short of God's standard. Because you can see here that the man leaves a father and a mother, not fathers and mothers, and he joins himself to one woman, not two. It tells you why adultery is prohibited. It tells you all of these things. But because of the question he's been asked, the thing that Jesus picks up against, again, is divorce. It's this implication that Jesus now draws out in verse 6. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. Now, one of the privileges of my job is that I often get to stand in front of a man or a woman as they make their vows on their wedding day. I've done that for a bunch of people in this room. And it's a huge privilege to see that moment and to be part of it. And at the beginning of a wedding, I'll often remind the gathered congregation that something remarkable is about to happen. That two single people are going to walk in and one married couple are going to walk out. But that remarkable event has not come about because of what they say or what I say. It is not even when I quote the exact words of Jesus in verse 6 and I hold their hands together and say, therefore what God has joined, let man not separate. It is not those words <clears throat> that make the marriage. It is God who makes the marriage. It's a remarkable thing, isn't it? 
God is the creator of marriage. And there are people, many of us in this room, who are married. And we can look back on those words that we've said, those vows that have been said or said for us. And we can realize here that what Jesus is teaching us is that marriage is not something we have created, but it's something that God has created. Well, it's in this context that Jesus now teaches the truth about divorce in 7 to 9. It turns out that Jesus' answer from Genesis is not what the Pharisees were looking for. They were not interested in the truth. They are there to trap him. And they want to do that now by attempting to set Moses, the great lawgiver of the, of the Old Testament, against Jesus' interpretation of Genesis 1 and 2, verse 7. Why then, they ask, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? The passage the Pharisees appeal to is Deuteronomy 24, 1 to 4. And so in order to understand this, we're going to have to go back and take a look at it. So maybe leave something in Matthew 19 and flip leftwards into Deuteronomy 24. The page numbers should be on the screen. And I'll give you a moment to do that. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 24, 1 to 4, verse, uh, page 202 in those Bibles on the pews. Now, this is a legal passage. It's written as part of the law that God gave to Israel. That's the context. And it's written in that kind of legal language, the if-then language. It's a language we still use today. If you ever read the small print of your insurance policy or your mortgage, you'll see this same kind of language. If this, then that. Well, verses 1 to 3 give us the long if part of, this, of the law. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house and if after she leaves his house she becomes the wife of another man and a second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce and gives it to her and sends her from his house or if he dies, there's the situation it's a situation that seems strange to us, but it's not actually that difficult to understand. It's a situation in which a man divorces his wife, verse 1. She then remarries, verse 2. Her second husband divorces her as well, or dies, verse 3. That is the situation. And Moses now gives a single prohibition, the then part, verse 4. If this, then, verse 4, her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. First of all, notice what this law is not doing. It has got nothing to do with allowing divorce, still less promoting it, even less commanding it. It simply recognizes that divorce will tragically happen in a fallen world, and it's seeking to regulate it. If you look at it, you'll notice that verses 1 to 3 are, in fact, just a description of a practice that is already happening among the Israelites. This certificate of divorce enabled the woman to leave the marriage clearly, unambiguously, being free to remarry, not to be at the whim of her first husband. But the only command in the passage is verse 4. The divorced woman is not allowed to marry the first husband again. Why? Because she's been defiled. How has she been defiled? Well, it can only be one thing, can't it? It can't be the remarriage to the first husband for she's already been defiled. It is therefore the second marriage, after she was divorced by the first husband, that is what has defiled her. 
This is what Jesus picks up. It is the divorce and the remarriage to another that causes her to commit adultery. Well, leave Deuteronomy 24. We don't need to go there again. And come back with me to Matthew 19. And see how Jesus applies this understanding of Deuteronomy 24 to the Pharisees' question. Matthew 19, verse 8. Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman commits adultery. Now Jesus draws two conclusions from all of this. One about marriage and divorce, which is kind of answering the Pharisees' question, and one about them, and indirectly about us. First, his conclusion from Deuteronomy 24 is that the legal allowance of divorce under Old Testament law did not avoid the consequences of adultery. Now, as you can imagine, there's been a a lot of debate about verse 9, and Bible-believing Christians come to different conclusions on it. It is most often taken, and the most obvious way to take it, is that Jesus is making a single exception to the Bible's absolute prohibition of divorce. That for a person who is the victim of their partner's sexual immorality, that person is free to divorce and remarry if they chose. Now, that has been debated, and there are some nuances here which we can't get into, and obviously this is part of the bigger picture of what the Bible teaches about these things, and what churches have to do is to work out their sort of pastoral policy in the light of all of that. That's the first thing Jesus is saying. He is making a statement about marriage and divorce. But Jesus is making a second point, and a bigger one, And we should not allow our questions about what is and is not allowed to obscure his second point. And it's captured in verse 8. Have a look at it again. Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. Now this is the moment Jesus sort of turns the table and he sets his own agenda. You see, the striking thing about the way the Pharisees have argued is that they have used the law of Moses to do the very opposite of its original intention. Deuteronomy 24 was a legal concession to limit the damage caused by a prevalent practice in Israel. It was not there to make divorce acceptable or easy, but it was there to control its consequences. But the Pharisees had taken that law and they'd used it as if Moses was commanding them to divorce, whereas he was simply permitting it because of the reality of sin. They turned it into a freedom for men, whereas it was intended to protect women and marriage. They turned it into an escape clause for marriage, whereas God's intention was to protect marriage and its permanence. They have badly twisted the word of God. And so can you see the irony here The situation which gave rise to the law in the first place was the evil in their hearts, which overlooked the divine intention set out in Genesis. How perverse then, how wicked of the Pharisees to use that law to justify the very practice which it was designed to control. The very law they were using for easy divorce was a testimony to the sinfulness of their hearts, which made the law necessary in the first place. But of course, Bible-believing Christians won't be surprised at this because the law is always doing that same thing. It is always exposing sin for what it is. And so we may conclude from this section, well, if this is the state of our hearts, then is there any hope for us? Well, all of that sets the scene for the third part of Jesus' teaching. He's going to teach the truth now in 10 to 12 about the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Jesus' reply seems to have silenced the Pharisees, 
But of course, the disciples have been listening to all of this, and now they have a question of their own, verse 10. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, it is better not to marry. At first sight, this is a very strange comment. It seems to align the disciples more with the Pharisees than with people who want to sit under the word of God. They appear, don't they, to be coming down on the side of the the liberal Pharisees, the selfish chauvinism, the ungodly faithfulness. As if they're saying, well, if I've got to put up with a woman who's going to burn my toes, then I'd rather stay single. But I don't think we should be too quick to judge the disciples in that way. It seems, in fact, that they have grasped the big truth of what Jesus has just said. They have realized the reality of the world and that the only option in this world is for a sinner to marry a fellow sinner. They've realized that their hearts are hard. And if they marry, they will marry people with hard hearts. And in such a world, this is going to be difficult and challenging. And if they're going to take seriously God's intention for the permanence of marriage and there's no possibility of divorce, then they're right, aren't they? This is going to be hard. And you better be very careful. And I think this way, because of how Jesus takes their reply so seriously in verse 11, Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word but only to those to whom it has been given. What is the word Jesus says not everyone can accept in verse 11? Well, I don't think it can be referring to his own authoritative teaching about the nature of marriage in 4 to 9. It's not likely that he would set out such clear teaching from Genesis and then say, well, this is my opinion, but not everyone can accept it. So it must be referring to the disciples' own conclusion in verse 10. It is better not to marry. That is the word that Jesus says not everyone can accept. In other words, Jesus is agreeing with the disciples that for some people it is better not to marry. But that's not going to be a word for everybody. Jesus then elaborates this point in a way that is even more strange to our ears than the disciples' comment, verse 12. For some are eunuchs because they were born that way, others were made that way by men, and others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Now, I don't think anyone in this room enjoys speaking about this topic. If you're new to church this morning, it might be that there's someone here who's walked in church for the first time, and let me assure you and encourage you, this is about as uncomfortable as it gets. I mean, next week we're going to come close because Jesus is going to talk about money and greed, and that also gets very uncomfortable. But this is unusual. But of course, like my mum's good old cod liver oil, it's this that is going to do us the most good. How is that the case? Because this is when Jesus is changing the whole agenda to his own. See, who are these eunuchs? Well, I've done a little bit of research on this, not too much, just enough research this week to realize that actually eunuchs were a more common factor of life in the first century than they are today. And so Jesus talking about this category of people was not quite so strange to his first hearers as it might seem to us. And men who were captured by their enemies, or imprisoned, or defeated in battle, or enslaved, would sometimes be castrated so that they were incapable of sex. Some would be born with a genetic defect from birth, and others would be castrated before puberty so they could serve in high places, in harems and places like that. You read about that in the book of Esther. But notice here, Jesus is speaking of three kinds of eunuch. The first two are literal, and the third metaphorical, and it's the third one that is the real focus, verse 12. Others have renounced marriage, literally made themselves eunuchs, because of the kingdom of heaven. 
Now remember that Jesus has just been talking about the goodness of marriage as a gift of God. Something that is part of God's plan and purpose for our world. Something that is good for us. The disciples have rightly concluded that if marriage is permanent and divorce is always a tragedy, then you better be careful. But notice what Jesus does. Instead of agreeing with the disciples on that level, he says, yes, maybe it is better not to marry, but not for the reason that you think. There is an even greater reason that you might not marry. There is the kingdom of heaven. There is something in this world that relativizes all of these things. There is a reality that actually puts all of this talk of sexual expression into its perspective so that some will renounce marriage altogether. There is the kingdom of heaven. There is the work of the gospel. There is something bigger in this world, the work of Jesus, that is of such massive importance that some people will happily forego the pleasures and benefits of marriage and give themselves to that work. Now, just think about that. This is massive. Because in our culture, what we call identity is king, isn't it? How I feel about myself, my choices, the kind of person I really feel I am inside, that is the inviolable value of our society. Challenge my sense of self-expression, especially my sexuality, at your peril. And so much so that you may have seen the news this week, I don't know how true this is, but apparently parents in Scotland are being warned that they could go to prison for denying their own children's right to choose their gender. That is where we are as a society. My self-expression is king. And so Jesus is saying something very countercultural. He is saying that if you understand the kingdom, you will give up your very identity. You will give up your very self. You will give up the deepest desires that a human being can have. You'll become a spiritual eunuch for his sake. How great must the kingdom of heaven be? How glorious must Jesus' gospel be if that is the case? And so you can look at church history and you can see men and women who have indeed done this, who have accepted this word who have foregone the gift of marriage, which is normal for most people, and instead have given themselves to the work of the kingdom. People like the Apostle Paul, who in 1 Corinthians 7 urges others to remain single like him in order to focus without distraction on the work of serving the Lord. It's a reminder, isn't it? In a passage that is so positive about marriage, that the Bible is also positive about the single state. Not describing it as a deprivation, but an opportunity and a privilege to serve God single-mindedly. But we need to press this a little bit more. Because I want you to think with me, within the pages of Matthew's Gospel, who is the one who can accept this, as Jesus puts it in verse 12? Well, it is, of course, Jesus himself. And that's why that context I mentioned earlier is so important. That Jesus is heading to Jerusalem to the cross. And it's on the cross that he will give up everything this world offers for the sake of others. It is actually Jesus who he is talking about here in the first instance. He is the one who forsakes marriage and family and sexual pleasure and companionship and self-expression and all the comforts and benefits of family life. And everything this world considers belonging to manhood. And he gives it all away in order to redeem his bride, the church. See, Jesus never calls on people to do anything he hasn't done himself. And so just as he makes this statement... He himself is on his way to fulfill it 
to give up his very self for the kingdom of heaven. But what about us? How are we to respond to this teaching? Well, we see that in the final section as we come to the children in verses 13 to 15. Normally, this little section is kind of put with the next section, but I think the little note Jesus went on from there in verse 15 encourages us to link this section to verses 1 to 12. And so why does Matthew end all of this section about divorce and remarriage with this scene about children? Well, I think there are two reasons. Firstly, because it helps us to understand how we are to respond to Jesus' teaching. Notice that the arrival of the children now puts Jesus in conflict with the disciples. Verse 13, Then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Why do the disciples not want children to come to Jesus? Because the disciples do not yet believe Jesus in chapter 18. <clears throat> when he said, in order to enter the kingdom, you have to become like a child. You have to become a nobody. And so the children are there to remind us of the posture of a true disciple. And to encourage us to contrast the children with the Pharisees. See, children are nobodies. The Pharisees are somebodies. The children are little. The Pharisees are big. The Pharisees come to Jesus to challenge him... The children are brought to Jesus by others. The Pharisees are full of their own sense of self-importance. The children have no sense of self-importance. The Pharisees come to trick Jesus. The children come to receive from Jesus. To sit at his feet and humbly receive what he has to offer. Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And so Matthew is telling us at the end of what for some will have been a hard passage to hear. To adopt that posture of childlike humility. To allow what might at first taste like cod liver oil to actually be the glorious honey of God's word that will do us good. And what will that mean in practice? Well, for those who are married, it will mean coming back again to the essential purpose of marriage and the purpose of marriage, the permanence of marriage. If you are married, you must keep working on your marriage, as Harry and Lydia prayed that we would earlier. We mustn't have the mindset of the Pharisees, which saw permission for divorce as permission to give up on marriage or pursue another partner, or take an easy way out. Now, Jesus is clear that divorce will happen, but it is always a tragedy. It is always in some way connected to the hardness of our hearts. And so being a humble disciple, therefore, means pursuing faithfulness that is God's intention for marriage. Faithfulness to keep the promises that were made at the start. Faithfulness to honor your spouse until death parts you. As with everything, Jesus sets the bar high, doesn't he? But striving to live God's way, to live the way God made us to live, is always good for us. And if you are married this morning, you might want to go away and reflect with your spouse to pray and to commit yourselves again to God's purpose. And as we always say in marriage prep, you can do your bit and leave the rest to God. And for some, being a humble disciple will mean actually accepting this word of renouncing marriage for the sake of the kingdom, of seeing the, the goodness of singleness in the context of a passage about the goodness of marriage as a particular opportunity for some to serve God with all of their lives. Well, that's the first thing. But there's something else we're to see here, something that applies to all of us. Remember that Jesus is on his way to die in Jerusalem. He is heading to Jerusalem to die, not for the righteous, but for the unrighteous. He's come not to heal the healthy, but the sick. 
He's come to save sinners, not saints. He's come for people who have failed in their marriages, for people who have committed adultery in their minds as well as their bodies. He's heading to Jerusalem to die for the hardness of all of our hearts, for those who have failed sexually, fallen short of God's standards in all sorts of ways. And I think what Matthew is doing in these last few verses is giving us a beautiful picture of the people who will make up the kingdom in the end. And to ask ourselves, are we going to see ourselves there? Can you see yourself as a child sitting at Jesus' feet with the humility to receive his forgiveness? Can you see yourselves there as someone who has received the Holy Spirit with soft hearts, now able to obey God and live the way he intended? Whether married or divorced or single, whether happy or miserable in those states, whether fulfilled or frustrated, Matthew is inviting us to see ourselves in that picture as children gathered around Jesus. Back in Isaiah 56, there is a promise made directly to the eunuch. The man who was rejected, unwelcomed, excluded from the assembly of God's people. Will, Isaiah says, at the coming of the kingdom, be given a blessing that is greater than sons and daughters. The blessing of being brought into the family of God and serving the Lord forever. And so here is a tiny glimpse of a picture of that end, of the work <clears throat> that Jesus is on his way to the cross to achieve as he gathers his children around him in the eternal kingdom of God. It's exactly like the song we sang, isn't it? That Anna taught us. God can make us daughters, God can make us sons. Jesus paid the price when he offered his life so that we can be part of God's family. Here is a picture of the promise of the gospel. Life from the dead. The family of God won by the sacrifice of Christ. A gathering of nobodies whose only hope is Christ. The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Well, let's pray we might be part of it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus' clarity in this passage. Thank you that you've not left us to drown in the darkness of our own ignorance and sin. We pray that you'd forgive us for the Pharisee that is in the heart of each of us. And help us now to respond to your word as little children. Thank you that you've made us as men and women and boys and girls. Thank you that you've created us in such a way that those who are married or will be married might be united with husband and wife, become one flesh, and live all our days in faithfulness to each other. Help us to grab hold of your purposes in marriage. Help us to work hard in the power of your spirit for faithfulness and unity. We acknowledge too that many of us are in pain and disappointment in this area because of our own sin and that of others. And we ask your mercy to forgive us and help us to forgive those who've sinned against us. And above all, we pray for all of us to keep our eyes fixed on the kingdom of Jesus, that our satisfaction, our joy, our hope will be on Jesus alone, that we might come into the new creation as his sons and daughters, knowing that he has saved us by his death on the cross. We pray this in his name. Amen.